Let me begin with a heartfelt thanks to President Watts and to Dean Vickers for their endless support and their kind words. Thank you also to the members of the Distinguished Faculty Lecture Committee and to Dr. Vickers and Dr. Lenfeld for nominating me for this award. I am deeply honored and humbled to be standing here with you tonight in the company of people I revere and respect. I was almost a concert pianist. I came very close to never being on the right continent to stand here with you tonight. For most of my life, science has been my driving force, my passion and my livelihood. So it may be difficult to imagine me in any other role. But from my early childhood, I was trained in classical piano, and that was where I dedicated my energy. Every musical composer who has ever lived has had the same notes to work with. And from these notes are born almost infinite variations of sound. Madeleine Lengel, the author of A Wrinkle in a Time, noted that it is the task of the artist to create cosmos out of chaos, or a symphony out of a bunch of notes. The task of the scientist is similar, to look at a wealth of data and find patterns, to see the chaos and find cosmos. I am here with you tonight instead of playing the piano in Poland or Egypt or Italy, because the refrain of my life joined with the melodies and harmonies of other remarkable people to create a cosmos I could not have imagined. I am sure that I'm not the only one to feel like my early years pass quickly like a flurry of notes played in a rapid pace. I grew up in Alexandria, Egypt, the jewel of Mediterranean. My parents raised me and my brother to value education and I dedicated myself to my studies. In Egypt, your future is determined in the final year of what is in the United States would be referred to as high school. The course of your life essentially is determined at the age of 16. Every student takes a comprehensive examination. Unlike the ACT or SAT, however, the test can only be taken once, and it decides your profession. A high score on the test means that you can go to medical school or engineering school. A lower score limits you to a narrower range of career options. Hard work earned me a high score on the test, which meant that I could go to medical school. This was the first change in the melody of my life. I did not have the time to dedicate myself both to music and to medicine. One of them have to go. Although my piano teacher encouraged me to choose music because in her words, medical school is not for women, I decided a medical career and pursued my studies at Alexandria University Faculty of Medicine. In my final year of training as physician, I was exposed for the first time to what I would later understand were the social determinants of health. As part of my training, I was assigned to work in a rural area outside of the city of Alexandria. The people in this town were not able to pay for medical care, and they suffered from chronic illnesses to an extent I had never seen before. Distrust for the medical profession ran deep. Patients died before they were able to be seen at the free university hospitals. I believe that most people become doctors because they want to help other people. And this encounter with patients struggling with the health burdens and with poverty stayed with me. Shortly after I finished medical school, my husband and I moved to the United States so that he could complete his doctorate work at Texas A&M. After this, he took a position for what we thought would be only one year at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. I didn't know at that time that the melody of my life had changed permanently. But it was in moving from the jewel of the Mediterranean to the magic city that my one simple tune became layered with the richness of other instruments and became much more than a melody. I wonder if sometimes composers are surprised at the direction of the second movement of a symphony. I wonder if a conductor is ever surprised at her own interpretation of a piece of music. 
caught in the flow of the movement, perhaps they are captured by a tide that feels not entirely of their own making. My husband had a job at the UEB School of Engineering, and I was determined to make a path for myself as well. I was admitted into the master's program in public health, and after the completion of my studies, I worked as a volunteer in turn for six months in the Division of Preventive Medicine. At last, I was successful in getting hired for a paid position as a fellow. Around this time, national research was beginning to demonstrate the same thing that researchers at UEB were finding, that health outcomes were different for different group of people. Some demographics were more likely to develop chronic or acute diseases and were less likely to survive them. This field of research and I found one another. I was assigned to the Birmingham City Heart Disease Prevention Project. Through this project, I discovered that Birmingham City sanitation workers suffered disproportionately from high blood pressure. I wanted to be able to provide meaningful education to these workers about how to manage their health, but I immediately ran into barriers. Our classes were scheduled at the Birmingham Public Library, and nobody was showing up. Finally, one of the supervisors told me that exhausted workers coming off a long shift that started at 4 o'clock in the morning were reluctant to leave their work site for the library. We began holding classes in the break room in their workplace instead although it was cramped and had little ventilation. Through discussion with the city employees, we came to an understanding of what educational tools worked and which ones didn't. Visual aids helped increase the impact of my message. Sanitation workers began to take proactive measures to lower their blood pressure. The program was so successful that the American Heart Association created a short documentary about our work. I'm going to share a snippet of that documentary with you now. You see healthcare messages everywhere, but traditional health education has not reached a huge segment of our society. Blue-collared and minority workers, many of whom are poor or illiterate. In Birmingham, Alabama, Health and city leaders are teaming up to overcome these barriers. A wellness program has been designed to reach every city employee from garbage collector to the mayor. Results show the program is working. Rather than rely on technical printed material or complicated charts, Dr. Mona Fuad uses visual aids to explain the dangers of high blood pressure to street and sanitation workers. Your blood pressure gets higher than the 150 over 95. That's mean high. That means that over that, if this stayed for a long time as it is, it can cause some complications, it can cause uh, kidney damage, uh, it can cause stroke. Earlier uh, teaching methods led to a high dropout rate and a low success rate of only 25%. But now, after a year in her class, almost three-fourths of the group lowered their high blood pressure to normal levels. Workers were taught to reduce blood pressure by changing their diet exercising, stopping smoking, and losing weight. Dr. Fuad announced the project's results at the American Heart Association scientific sessions. This way of teaching attracted the people. They like to come, they participate in the class, they see something different. The class is part of one of the largest, most comprehensive worksite prevention programs for heart disease risk factors in the United States. Since the project began in 1984, the team has screened about 4,000 city employees 50% black and 20% women. While barriers to good health still exist, the Birmingham Project is breaking new ground in changing health behavior. Todd Bauer reporting for the American Heart Association. I was coming to realize through my work at UEB and my earlier work in rural Egypt that health was not a simple matter of taking the right medications or eating healthy. Health outcomes were determined by a number of interlocking factors. Just as a piece of music cannot be ap appreciated by listening to only one-tenth of the notes, health could not be understood by looking at only one set of issues. 
Any musicians will tell you that timing is everything. Play the right notes at the wrong time and instead of beauty, you get chaos. How fortunate I was in my timing. I was at the right place, UEB, at exactly the right time. Shortly after my arrival in the Division of Preventive Medicine, Dr. Karina Kiefer was hired as faculty. I needed a mentor for a grant that I was writing, and I gathered my courage and approached her. I knocked on her office door and said, I have this grant, can you help me? She didn't know me, but despite this, she took an active interest in my career and introduced me to the people I needed to know. One of these people was Dr. Ed Partridge. It feels so unlikely that a woman doctor from Alexandria, Egypt, and a surgeon from Demopolis, Alabama, would meet and form a lasting professional collaboration. Together, he and I began to research health disparities. Later, I was to begin collaborating with Dr. Selwyn Vickers, another surgeon from Demopolis, Alabama. This relationship would also prove pivotal to my career. It seems like there is an invisible line between Demopolis, Alabama and Alexandria, Egypt that we don't know about. It happened that Alabama was the perfect place to study health disparities. In fact, it served as a laboratory of sorts. Rates of cancer, heart disease, diabetes, and other chronic illnesses are higher in the Deep South than elsewhere in the country. Average life expectancy in Alabama is also one of the lowest in the nation. Since poverty, race, unemployment, and lower education are all indicators of health disparities, there are few places in the country as well suited to this research. One of the earliest challenges we faced was in enrolling minority participants for clinical trials. According to the National Institute of Minority Health and Health Disparities, minorities account for fewer than 10% of patients enrolled in clinical trials. This is a significant problem because clinical trials are absolutely essential to improving health for a number of reasons. Without minority participation, we could not achieve insights critical to the treatment for all patients. However, there was a high level of distrust toward medical providers among many underserved populations, and for good reasons. Historically in the South, especially, Minorities have experienced harm at the hand of medical research. If we couldn't change the situation, health disparities would only deepen and increase. And it was at this point we experienced a key breakthrough, a pivot point. The critical factor we realized was trust. Just as with the Birmingham city sanitation workers, we needed to meet people where they were and engage the community. This led to the creation of the Recruitment and Retention Shared Facility. This facility focused on building community relationships. And to that end, we trained team members at every stage of the process of recruiting and retaining participants. In the two decades since the establishment of this facility, we have enrolled nearly 45,000 participants for 115 research studies at UEB, adding priceless knowledge and insight into minority health. Trust wasn't just a key factor for enrollment of patients in clinical trial. It formed the cornerstone of all of our health disparities work. One of our findings was that, especially in certain economically disadvantaged communities, African-American women were less likely to undergo breast and cervical cancer screenings. This meant that they were less likely to catch these diseases early enough to have a chance of good health outcome. There were many reasons for this. Apart from distrust of the medical establishment, many women had inadequate community and family support or lacked access to transportation or primary care physicians. We understood from earlier work with women in Jefferson County that Finding and training community health advisors could make all the difference. We focused on building community capacity. Through finding and training community health advisors, natural helpers who would engage women in taking ownership over their health. 
It was through this work that we made another key discovery. Women whose screenings were positive for cancer encountered unique challenges in making their way through the healthcare system. In response to this, we developed a patient navigators program, which assigns a trained navigator familiar with the essential resources, including transportation, state-based assistance, and the process of accessing care to each individual. The results were astounding. Not only were, were we able to close a 17% gap in cancer screening between white women and African-American women, by 2006, African-American women were actually being screened at a higher rate than white women, and navigators were successful in helping them follow up their treatment. This movement was played in a parallel to a national movement on health disparities a movement which interacted with and complemented what was taking place at UEB. In 1990, my mentor, Dr. Jean Ruffin, was appointed the Associate Director for Research in Minority Health in the newly created Office of Research in Minority Health at NIH. As we use grant funding to increase minority enrollment in clinical trials, establish community health advisors, and create patient navigators program, the understanding of health disparities as a key area of research was growing on a national level. At the turn of the millennium, the Office of Research in Minority Health under the leadership of Dr. John Ruffin was elevated to the National Center on Minority Health and Health Disparities. Two years later, I received pilot funding from UEB to establish the Minority Health and Health Disparity Research Center, MHRC, which has expanded through an NIH Center of Excellence grant with Dean Vickers as the PI. I was also drawn into the national effort as one of four people asked to assist in developing health disparities initiatives for NCMHD at NIH. Much of our energy during this time was spent trying to convince the scientific community that health disparities research is a science not just community research, because the challenge of health disparities was so complex and resisted simple solutions, it required insights from across a wide range of fields, basic science to clinical and outcomes research, among others. Still, UEB and NIH pushed forward, sharing a common vision and mission. As they grew, we grew. Nationally, participatory-based research programs were established and crucial research reports were released. The UAB MHRC became a university-wide interdisciplinary research center and partnerships with historically black colleges and universities were established. Then at last, we achieved a key breakthrough. Dr. John Ruffin was successful in getting the National Center for Minority Health Disparities elevated to the level of an, an institute at NIH, giving it the scope to initiate and drive research on health disparities as never before. This coincided with the expansion of our research initiatives. Our research was published in national peer-reviewed journals, and continued grant funding validated the work we pursued. In fact, the MHRC has recently celebrated 17 years of continuously funded operations. After decades of intensive research and dedicated interventions, we had established collectively and collaboratively that health disparity research was a valid field of scientific study. It is easy to get trapped in the numbers, to miss the symphony of the notes, but our health disparities work has always been about the lives of real people. I remember after we started the Patient Navigators Program, hearing a young woman speak in Montgomery. This young mother had breast cancer and was part of the Patient Navigators Program. She said, what people don't understand is that if you have breast cancer and you are a single mom, you can end up homeless. This program saved me. Not only did you get me treatment, you helped me keep my home, my job, and my family. 
The composition of this work has expanded beyond anything I could have imagined myself. In the last few years alone, our work on a state, regional, national, and even international level has continued to grow and expand. Realizing that a lack of minority researchers was contributing to the persistence of health disparities, we developed multi-tier training programs. These programs targeting undergraduates, graduate students, postdoctoral scholars, and junior faculty have impacted individuals throughout the country. They now provide minority representation in the health professions and contribute critical research insights to our understanding of health disparities. In all, more than 750 scholars have been trained by the various programs we developed and continue to offer. We continue to receive health disparities funding from the NIH that moved us from a local operation to a regional center through the establishment of the Mid-South Transdisciplinary Collaborative Center. This involved collaborations across six states with five academic institutions and 110 community organizations. Most recent funding established the Obesity Health Disparity Research Center, bringing the EUB return on investment to more than $160 million in external health disparities funding. This scientific symphony we composed together has been modeled now, not only regionally and nationally, but globally. We have partnered in the United Kingdom, where I sit on the board for the Center for Community Health and Development, which was modeled on the MHRC and also in my home country of Egypt. In Alexandria, we have trained medical students and junior faculty to perform research to identify populations that are at higher risk for colorectal cancer and to develop interventions for those populations. It is a miraculous feeling to see the work for which we have labored so long and so passionately take hold and bear fruit all around the world. Sometimes it can feel that the success that you are hoping to achieve is so far away or that your goals are just out of your reach. But my career shows that you can start anywhere and by remaining open to the presence and contributions of other people and the universe as a whole, you can ascend and high, any height you choose. Last year, I was honored to be included in the National Academy of Medicine. And this year, I am overjoyed to share with you in this celebration of the Award of Distinguished Faculty Lecturer. By ourselves, we are a single melody. Each action we take, each decision point, is a new refrain, turning a handful of notes into something artfully and meaningfully constructed. The choices that we make and the challenges we embrace layer complexity and dimensions onto this simple melody. We started with a small revelations, organic interventions, and each new discovery brought new harmonies and counterpoints, turning what had been a simple tune into a greater whole. We began with rigorous research, and from the notes of many data points began to understand the shape of the entire composition. We came to see the importance of going to communities for solution. We embraced the challenge of turning new researchers. Interdisciplinary approaches offered new insights. Communicating our findings gave us feedback from other scientists. Global partnerships allowed us to expand our reach. Continual curiosity allows us to develop a new direction. And who knows what the future might hold. I expect even greater discoveries and breakthrough in our research. In addition to my faith in God, by far the greatest texture has been added by the people whom I have been privileged to have in my life. My brilliant husband, Fouad, while pursuing a remarkable career of his own, has offered me limitless support and encouragement and has always been a source of inspiration. I could not ask for a better life partner. 
My exceptional daughters, Nancy and Mary, not only fill me with pride, but ground and lift me to embrace new challenges. My mentors and collaborators, Dr. Karina Kifa, Dr. John Ruffin, Dr. Ed Partridge, and Dr. Selwyn Vickers, were symphonies unto themselves. And where we intersected, I was left infinitely richer for the interaction. Just as I owe credit and recognition to my mentors and colleagues, I owe immeasurable thanks to the incredible faculty and staff with whom I have worked over the course of my career, who have brought their timeless dimension to this work. One speech alone would be insufficient to even name them, let alone give them the praise that they are due. But you know who you are, and I hope you will hear my thanks as I offer it from the bottom of my heart.